Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Lead, Sell, Grow, the Human Experience Podcast, where we talk about all things about sales, leadership, business growth, and overall that human experience. I love hearing good stories. Today, I bring you another one. We have my good friend, Jeremy Ryan Slate. He's an entrepreneur, media expert, author, and CEO of Command Your Brand. He studied literature at Oxford University. If you don't know where that is, that is all the way across the pond in the UK. He's also a former champion powerlifter, and you're watching this on, on uh, YouTube. You see those guns. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Podcast Magazine just included Jeremy on their 2022 40 under 40 in podcasting list. Wow. Jeremy, welcome to the show, man. Hey, man. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked to be here. Uh... Uh, I, I always love when I get to talk a little bit of powerlifting too, man. It's always fun. <laughs> oh, you look great. No, I'm good, trying my uh, best, man. I compliment. I competed um, at so I'm I'm only like five five. I competed at the the 192 class, um, so I look like a bowling ball then. Um, now I'm like a you know 170, so it's a big difference. Yeah, 192 five five. That's huge. <laughs> I was a bowling ball, man. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. So, where did you grow up, and how did you end up in Oxford? So um, I grew up in New Jersey. I've been I've been a lifelong Jersey resident. I actually live uh, 45 minutes away from where I grew up now. It's slightly more rural, you know, a lot of farms and stuff out here. I went to Seton Hall University in New Jersey, and they actually have a program where they uh, give you like scholarships to go study abroad. So um, after I graduated from undergrad, I did a program in between my undergrad and my master's where, um, you know, Seton Hall basically paid for me to go to school at New College Oxford, which was, which was pretty cool. I studied a lot of Chesterton, Lewis, stuff like that. Uh, ate some really bad food because I'll be honest with you, the food in the UK is not very good, especially when, when you're from New Jersey and we're used to really good food. Yep. Um, so, yeah, man. <laughs> Fish and chips, yeah. Yeah, it's just, I don't know, like, I, not, I, I love the UK, don't get me wrong, and I have a lot of, you know, friends from the UK, but at the same time, like, I don't know if like taste buds don't work there or what, man. Like the food is just, it, I don't know. It's just not as good. Oh man. All right. So what did you study there? I studied literature. So it was, um, um, my, my degree in undergrad was in uh, Catholic theology. So I actually studied, um, like, uh, you know, Catholic literature. So it was like GK Chesterton, CS Lewis, J.R.R. Tol- R. R. Tolkien, like stuff like that. Um, and it's just very interesting stuff. Cause I, I love telling a good story, um, which is, you know, a lot of what that was about. Yeah. Okay. And are you using any of that now? <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> I paid way too much money for degrees. I do not use man, because when I went to school. They didn't realize like podcasting was going to be a thing. Yeah. So were you already bodybuilding back then? Or I, so I, I've been powerlifting um, since I was uh, 18. I wrestled in school. So, uh, you know, right after I graduated high school, I didn't go to college for, for wrestling. But so I, I ended up getting into the, the whole powerlifting sphere because it's a very similar like type of feel. You know, you wear singlet, all that fun stuff. And uh, so at 17, 18 years old, I went right into powerlifting and I wrestled 140. So I was a much you know smaller guy at that point. And it took a lot of years of what I like to call linear progression. You know, you get five pounds stronger on something every week after a really long time. That's really strong. So that was kind of the the strategy I applied and started at like 17, 18. How much can you, uh, how much can you bench bench on incline? Well, not anymore. Um, so like, like, here's the thing, like back in the day, man, I could do 275 on incline. No problem. Um, now if I'm hitting 225, it's a good day just because I'm, I'm a lot smaller. I was benching 455 for a single at that point. I put up 315 for four the other day, and that was like a big deal because it was the first time I touched it in a couple of years. So, incline um, or flat? Flat. Okay. Um, incline, I, the best I ever did was 275 on an incline. Got it. Got it. I was always jealous of you, short guys, man, because you don't have that whole, you know, you don't have to come all the way up. You should see my deadlift, man. I barely have to move. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I love it. All right. Awesome, man. So, you know, it's funny. I'm listening to you and I bet a bunch of people in your school in New Jersey had the opportunity to go to Oxford, but did not take it. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the difference between those who said, yeah, I want to go try that. And those that didn't, you know, it's, it's some people, I think they look at, they look at opportunities as like, well, where's this going to get me? What's this going to do for me? I feel like my generation, like I'll be 35 next week. I feel like my generation is really bad with this, especially now. 
like I interviewed somebody recently and it's like, so it's an entry level position. I want to make $30. And I'm like, <laughs> you want to make what to start out with? So I think that people's expectations of what they're going to get at opportunities, especially in my generation has changed. And what it really comes down to is you have to be willing to see an opportunity, take it and figure out what you're going to do with it. But way too often people look for opportunities of what is this going to do for me rather than what can I do with this? And I think for me, that was my viewpoint, man. I was like, Oh, this is really cool. It looked great on a resume and I meet, might meet some cool people. Um, I don't really use a resume anymore. So that part of it kind of fell through, but I made a lot of really great friends and uh, connected with some cool people in the literary world, which is, you know, at this day, I still correspond with them. Have you always had that mindset? You know, I didn't. And I, I will tell you, fitness was a big thing that did that for me. Um, you know, going from, um, you know, at 17, 18, as I mentioned, I wrestled 140 pounds. I was a little guy. I wrestled 103s my freshman year. So I was always, I was always small weights and I didn't have a ton of confidence. So I was a, a pretty good wrestler. It was weightlifting that really, really did that for me because you could see accomplishments very quickly and it created a level of confidence where like, yeah, I can pick that up. You know, that'll happen. And so for me, fitness, I think was my biggest personal development tool because it, showed me very quickly a lot of what I could do and, and gave me confidence in that. Man, I, I absolutely love it. So now you're a business owner. How do you think your fitness, you know, wrestling, powerlifting, Oxford all ties into the way you run your business today? I, I think I picked up something from each one of those things, especially like, you know, I tried a lot of businesses didn't work out as well. You know, I did the whole network marketing thing where go recruit a whole bunch of people and get them to sell stuff. Um, Which I did, one was uh, it? What were you it selling? It was uh, Market America. We sell everything. Would you like some everything? <laughs> um, so, so I did that. I sold life insurance. I sold products on Amazon, and like I failed at all these different things. But like you know, I learned how to run a meeting. I learned how to cold call people. I learned how to do all these different things. So when I look at each one of those things, like at the same time, I learned about podcasting in grad school um, from a professor that was very into podcasting. It might have taken a while before I discovered that. It may not have crossed my path at all until now. I learned how to write, which was a really big deal because that's a skill I learned to this day. Um, you know, I have a book coming out in uh, about a month. Um, and frankly, the writing skills I learned have still helped me, you know, to this day. So that's a really big part of it. Um, at the same time, um, I think it's taught me to finish a project as well, because I was somebody that um, I could set a target really good, really well for doing a long paper or writing a, like I'd, we'd have to write 20 to 50 page papers in, in grad school for history. So like, I learned how to really accomplish something like that. And that's really helped me with like target and goal setting now as well. Man, that, that is really good. So everything you said, I still, I'm trying to, I'm a sales guy, right? I'm trying to figure yeah, yeah. out where did the sales come into play? Like, life insurance, have, man. <laughs> no, no, I got life. that. But what made you want to even get into life insurance or the multi-level thing or. So um, in 2012, my mom ended up having a really bad stroke. Um, and at that point in time, I was teaching in private school, which you don't need a degree, uh, like a, like any sort of like a teaching degree to do, but it also means like they pay you, like you're working at a Burger King drive through and you work like a hundred hours a week. So I'm, you know, and, and they want you to volunteer for everything, which they don't pay extra for. So it's like, you got to come to the dance and watch the kids, but we're not going to pay you for it. You better be here. So it was a lot of hours. It was really hard. Um, you know, I look like I'm like 20 now. You can imagine what I looked like at 24 when I had that job. I looked like I was like 17. So it was just a really difficult job. And I very quickly became not happy with, with what I was doing and what I was going to do the rest of my life. So when my mom had a stroke, it kind of like spun me out a little bit and made me start looking for something. And my wife was presented with that network marketing opportunity. Didn't know what it was. I guess I was somewhat sheltered. So I saw this presentation. I'm like, oh, million dollars in a couple of weeks. This would be great, man. Um, didn't do that. Um, but it was kind of the first thing to set me on looking for something. And, you know, I had to learn how to sell. I had to learn how to communicate. I think the best skill that I've learned, and, you know, as, as somebody in sales, you can appreciate this. Cold calling is the single best skill I have ever learned. And it's the thing that most people will not do. But it is the single best skill that I've learned. It was from having to call people that were avoiding me. Or different things like that. You know, life insurance and network marketing taught me a lot on how to sell stuff. Have you found like the uh, the fastest way to bridge the gap between somebody who doesn't want to talk to you to getting them to talk to you? Yeah, get a second phone number. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> so you have your regular phone number and you have your Google voice number. And when they're avoiding you, you call them on the Google voice number and you're like, hey, how's it going? 
I know you've been avoiding me. And it's, it's interesting though, because like when you can make it a joke like that and they can laugh, they'll actually talk to you and you can kind of talk some things out. And I've actually had that work out quite well for me, but yeah, I have a second phone number, man. That is great. The other, the other thing that's worked for me is switch up the times that you call. Sometimes, you know, if yeah. you're calling business people, you want to call them after five, before eight, different times a day, be funny, charming, all that fun stuff. And uh, like, I found something that worked for me too, because like, um, this was around like 2012, 2013, 14. It was kind of like on the iPhone when you could start sending voice messages. Um, I found those actually work really well because it allows you to get kind of your side of the story in uh, and get them to call you back. I've had those be very effective for me. Oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a great, great idea. Okay, so so you got into this network marketing thing, major mm-hmm. million dollars in the first month. No, 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 no. I made $12,000 in credit card debt. That's what I did. Um, but it- <laughs> good job. <laughs> I was great at doing that, man. So what happened? So I believe it or not, I actually learned how to make money in network marketing. Um, I, and I did pretty well, like we weren't killing it, but we were doing, you know, four or $5,000 a month, which isn't crazy, but it's more than most people will ever do in that world. Mm -hmm. So we were doing well. Um, but I just got tired of like the burnout of doing it, man. Like you got to constantly be recruiting new people. You start to feel kind of weird in your social settings. Like, Hey, I've got this thing. Do you want to buy my thing? And it's like, you know what I mean? And it's, you're, you're trying to find something wrong with, with everybody's life and what they're happy with. So you can like sell them this opportunity. And it just kind of, for me, it made me start to feel like a really weird person. And I just didn't want to do that anymore. Um, so I ended up uh, selling life insurance from there and, uh, I was good at that, but like having those like death conversations every day, man, like it can be quite depressing. So I, I, I did it for a while. I made some good money, but it's like, that's depressing, man. What made you successful at selling life insurance? I was re- so this is going to sound sad, but um, like an insurance agent doesn't make a whole lot of money off of term insurance. They make a whole lot of money off of, off of whole life. So I had gotten really good at showing somebody the cash value of whole life over time um, and, you know, kind of showing them how it becomes an asset and things like that. So that's what made me good at selling insurance is I really was able to show people um, the value in whole life. And I also did a lot of annuities as well. Um but for ins- most insurance agents, if you're selling term, you don't make money, man. But but truly, the but term life- is what's best for the client, though. I will tell you that. Really? Why is that? Well, because here's the thing. For most people, right, your monthly payment is going to be so much higher for whole life. And yeah, eventually it's going to have cash value. And that's great. But for most people, like after you have kids, you don't care. You know, after your kids leave the house, you don't care that much about insurance. Right. So for most people and where they're at, and especially like when the economy's tight, term is what is what's better for most people though when you buy in young you can get a better price on on whole life i like the concept of whole life because you can borrow against it with the cash value personally that's what i do now um we have a we have a a life insurance policy we kind of use to like cut out the bank right because you know banks can can suck sometimes so we've become our own bank yep um and you can find a good one like i think for for us um the um it grows at like i think four or five percent um, and the penalty is only two and a half percent when you borrow from it. So even by borrowing off, off of it and paying it back, you're still making about one and a half to two percent. Exactly. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, OK, really cool, man. So how did you get into the podcasting? So I uh, had this college professor, um, Dr. Sean Lake. I'm still friends with him to this day. He actually lives. Uh, he lives in, in your neck of the woods. He's in uh, in Tampa. So he's not not too far. Um, but I, I was standing outside of his office one day and I heard what sounded like a Z 100 morning show. I'm like, what is this guy doing in there? And, um, I walk in and he's like, oh, it's a podcast. And the podcast was called the no agenda show. I still listen to it to this day. It's hosted by, uh, John Dvorak and Adam Curry. Adam Curry is actually the pod father, the guy that invented podcasting. Wow. And, and, um, I, he got me hooked on that podcast and I've been a fan since like 2000 nine or something like that. And I've always been somebody that's listened to podcasts at that point in time. It was a lot of like audio books in the public domain as well. And eventually when I had tried all these things and it didn't work out, I was like, well, let me start a podcast. What's the worst that can happen? And the first version was called rock your life. It was terrible. Somebody else had the name. So I got hit with one of these like cease and desist letters and I quit it like 60 days in. And it wasn't until like the middle of 2015, I started my current show, which is Create Your Own Life, which we saw 10,000 listens in our first month. Um, I got to talk to a lot of really, really cool people. Um, and it, it kind of launched me in everything I'm doing now. 
Man, I absolutely love it. So talk to us about what you're doing now. So we have a company called Command Your Brand, and we are a PR firm for the podcast space. Um, I really think that podcasting is really the direction media is going. Um, you know, it, it's all about personal branding now. It's all about conversations. Like if you think about a lot of the media you've consumed over the years, what are you getting? Like a 10 minute clip, a five minute clip. Like I've listened to episodes of Joe Rogan that are like two or three hours. I couldn't do that Jordan Peterson one, man. Four hours is a little too much to ask. Um, but I've listened to a lot of really long form interviews. And I think listeners are really getting to know people better. And they're really getting to understand people. And it's becoming more of a learning platform. So for a lot of people out there, you can actually become the information and become the teaching. Um, and that's what we're really trying to help people do, man. Yeah, no, I get it. So what does it look like? Uh, you know, a lot of people who are listening might not even know your services exist. What's a PR firm in a podcasting space do? So we help people first and foremost with figuring out who you need to be in front of because the biggest mistake everybody makes, it doesn't matter if they're working with us or doing something else, is they go way too broad to start out with and they think their audience is everybody. So we really help somebody figure out, you know, what is that niche? And then after that, like, how do you tell a better story? And, you know, how do you make that relate to everything else you're doing? Um, and then from there, we actually help them find the right shows and help them get booked on those shows. When did you get the idea to do this business? Uh, kicking and screaming. Actually, I had no desire to start it. Um, as I, as I mentioned, the, the podcast was pretty successful early on and I had a lot of people actually say like, Hey, can you help me do what you're doing? I'm like, what? Start a podcast. So I started a company that did podcasts for people. And number one, I didn't know how to hire anybody. I didn't know how to bill people. So like I was making like nothing doing it. But one of the things we did was we got people on other podcasts first as like an awareness campaign to help other people learn about it. And we saw so much success with that. Our clients are like, these podcasts are cool, but can you just get me on other shows? And, you know, from there, we just focused on getting better and better at that. And, uh, you know, over the, over the years, we've, we've gotten the team up to, to 15 people and we, we've managed to, to really create some cool stuff. Dude, that's awesome. So what did you do to monetize? Like when you say my, my show was successful, how are you measuring success? Really just from visibility and who I was talking to. Um, I was, I've, I've always been really good and still really good at like getting connected to like high level people I want to interview and, you know, having some really good conversations. Like I've interviewed um, a four time Indy 500 champion. I've interviewed like some people I love in the sales world, like Grant Cardone, uh, Seth Godin. So I've had, I've been really good at figuring that out and it got me a lot of visibility early on. So other people wanted to know, like, you know, how can I make an impact? Like you're making an impact. I heard Seth Godin say that uh, he'll never go on anybody's podcast unless they have a hundred episodes. That's correct. Um, and and for me, he actually made the bar higher too. I, he was one of the first people I reached out to because, like, you know, you're, I didn't know anything what I was doing, man. I was just kind of like stumbling through the dark trying to do what I could do. I emailed him. He's like, "Hey, you started a podcast. Congratulations! Uh, when you get to four hundred episodes, send uh, me an email, and we'll do it." And he was episode four hundred, by the way. But like, he did say four hundred episodes. <laughs> I, oh man, I wish I would have remembered where he, where I heard him say 100 this way. It was probably Tim Ferriss. Cause he did, he was on there a couple of times where he was talking about like, um, like personal branding. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Tim's got a really good, good show. Um, yeah, dude, that's pretty sick. How'd you get Grant Cardone? I walked into him at a fundraiser after being told no by his team 10 times. <laughs> What'd you say? He's like, he's like, Hey man, uh, my wife, my wife was talking to him, talking to him and his wife, to him and Elena. And she goes, Oh, uh, Jerry, look who I'm talking to. I'm like, Oh, that's Grant Cardone. It's like, Hey man, what do you do? I'm like, Oh, I have a podcast. Uh, I'd love to be on that. I'm like, you're serious. Like your team's been telling me, no, he's like, this is the person you're going to email. This is what you're going to tell him. And we're going to get it done. And that's actually how I got the interview. Cause I met him in person and he was like a super cool guy that just wanted to know all about me. Yeah, I actually, it's funny because I, I go through like flows of who I'm listening to when I'm on a treadmill or driving and Evan Carmichael does his top 10 rules of whatever, you know, well, he's got Grant Cardone. It's like top 30 rules for success with Grant Cardone or something like that. And his, I mean, just like him, hate him. His story is incredible and what he's accomplished. Yeah. You can't take that away. That's pretty awesome. Um, awesome, Jeremy. So if somebody wants to hop on more shows, what's the best way they can reach out to you? Yeah. So they can check us out over at commandyourbrand.com or shoot me an email. I'm Jeremy at commandyourbrand.com and I'm, I'm more than happy to chat with them. Awesome, brother. Well, it was very nice to meet you and I'm glad we had you on. Got a chance to chat with you. You sound like an awesome guy and I'll check out your show as well. 
Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks for being here, Jim.